Last year, when we signed up hemp farmers and we paid them $300 a ton for their stocks, they were getting the same money they were getting for corn when corn was at $7 a bushel. Now this year, the price per bushel for corn has dropped down in the $4 range. Um, and so now they have that extra margin in there where hemp is better than corn because we haven't brought our prices down as corn prices have dropped. That's Ken Meyer from Complete Hemp Processing in South Dakota. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock. Welcome back to the show. I'm glad you're here. Today, I'll be talking to Ken Meyer. Ken is a fourth generation beekeeper. His family's business is called A.H. Meyer and Sons, which Ken runs today with his siblings. So last year, Ken and the crew brought South Dakota's first processing facility online in Winfred, South Dakota. So today I'm going to talk to Ken about hemp in South Dakota and that really interesting intersection of hemp and bees. But first, a few words from our sponsors. Our show today is brought to you with generous support from IND Hemp in Fort Benton, Montana. IND Hemp is a family-owned, mission-driven, and environmentally focused industrial hemp food, feed, and fiber company that's providing new opportunities for farmers and rural communities in Montana and across the American West. Check them out at indhemp.com. Also, today our show is brought to you by King's Agri-Seeds from right here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. As a supplier of hemp seed, Kings can help you choose the varieties that are right for your market and for your farm. Check them out at kingsagriseeds.com. And also this week, we are bringing on a new sponsor. And so this episode of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is brought to you in part by the Pennsylvania Hemp Industry Council, the PAHIC whose mission is to bring industrial hemp back to the farm fields and factories of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania can be a leader in the national bioeconomy with industrial hemp. PAHIC is building a dynamic collaboration between farmers, businesses, investors, government agencies, and the community to make it happen. Through a grant from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, PAHIC has assembled great resources for hemp entrepreneurs and investors to help them navigate this exciting sector of sustainability, including a free toolkit for Pennsylvania hemp entrepreneurs to get their businesses investment ready. Learn more at PAHIC.org. And finally, here's the spot from Forever Green. This is their ad for the hemp cutter. I love this ad because it feels like I'm on the radio. The KP4 Hemp Cutter. Introducing a revolution in hemp harvesting. Setting a new standard for harvesting quality, speed, and efficiency. The KP4 prepares hemp for ideal redding and easy on-field tedding, raking, and baling. Easy to maintain and designed to withstand the punishments of hemp harvesting. The KP4 Hemp Cutter. Available only at HempCutter.com. Okay, welcome back. So here we are. It's the first week of April 2024 here in Pennsylvania. It's been rather spring-like right now. It's rainy. Uh, things are greening up for sure. The, the peepers are singing. You know, everything's happening. All systems go. Next week, I am headed out to Estes Park, Colorado for the 10th annual NOCO Hemp Expo. I am looking forward to that. I will be reporting from there, so be on the lookout for NOCO content in the next couple of weeks. I've been publishing some bonus episodes here on the show, so if you have not seen those bonus episodes come through your feed, go to your app and check out the page. Uh, you don't want to miss anything. I'll have another bonus episode coming out later this week, and it's going to be about uh, hemp as a livestock feed, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, I am excited to share this conversation with Ken Meyer with you. So it turns out I really love bees and I like hearing about bees. So I enjoyed this conversation with Ken and I hope you do too. All right, here we go. 
Ken Meyer from Complete Hemp Processing in Winfred, South Dakota. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me on your podcast. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, we've known each other for a few years. I met you, I'm not even sure when, but it's been great to sort of watch your progress. Uh, because I think when I first met you, you were just about to get into processing. And now here you are. Uh, you, you started the first hemp processing center in South Dakota. So anyway, why don't we start with a, a brief introduction? Tell me who you are, Ken Meyer. Yes, uh, Ken Meyer. I uh, work in a business with my brother and sister. Uh, the, our, our main company is Age Meyer and & Sons. And in the hemp space, uh, we operate under complete hemp processing. Excellent. And we'll get to the other business a little bit later, but is that there's some beekeeping involved there, right? Right. We've been about uh, 90 plus years involved in the beekeeping industry as a family. My brother, sister, and I are fourth generation beekeepers. Wow. That's awesome. I can't wait to hear about that. Let's let's start first with the, uh, the hemp though. Um, so tell me about the Complete Hemp Processing Center. Where is it? What does it look like? You know, capacity? Just So our footprint in uh, Winfred, South Dakota is about 25,000 square feet. Uh, we operate the uh, formation ag uh, processing equipment. And uh, besides our processing building in that footprint, we have about a 10,000 square feet for drying the hemp before we bring it into the process area. And that's a fully insulated building with a heated floor and a lot of big fans. Okay, so you bring the bales in off the field and, and you dry them there, or tell me about that. Uh, we contract with farmers to grow the hemp. Uh, last year, we contracted for 1,600 acres. This year, we're right at 2,000 acres. Then the uh, farmers bring uh, the bales to us per our contract at uh, roughly the rate of a third of their harvest at harvest time. And then a few months out into the second quarter, they bring a second third. And then as we're coming into the spring, they bring the last third of their bales. Okay. Keeps it spread out. Um, you mentioned that there was a, an increase from last year to this year. Um, is that you bringing more farmers in or is that existing farmers expanding uh, what they want to produce? It's definitely a mix of both. Uh, so, for example, uh, one, two farmers that did 300 acres last year, this year are doing 500 each. So we definitely see that type of thing. The other thing that's in play this year is that the corn prices are much lower than they were last spring when we were signing up acres for hemp. And so there's a lot of interest in growing hemp in rotation with corn and soybeans. And the, the income is better from hemp. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that real quick. Uh, how does, how does the hemp compare to corn? Can you uh, give me any numbers? So, uh, it's going to vary for different farmers depending on their land and yields. Um, so I can speak more to the hemp. What I can tell you is that last year when we signed up hemp farmers and we paid them $300 a ton, uh, for their stocks, they were, getting the same money they were getting for corn when corn was at seven dollars um, a bushel okay now now this year um, the price per bushel for corn has dropped down in the four dollar range um, and so now they have that extra margin in there where hemp is better than corn because we haven't brought our prices down as corn prices have dropped awesome um, and that's really what it takes for these farmers. It just has to make sense, you know, money-wise, right? Uh, right. They want to grow it for all the reasons that we often talk about. Um, healthy soil. It's not good to just be growing the same crops on their land. But yes, each crop that they grow uh, does have to cash flow since yeah. that's their livelihood. Right. And these guys are are corn and soy growers? Yes, the farmers that we're working with are mainly corn and soybean uh, growers. Um, last year, we did work with a large um, organic farm. And of course, on an organic farm, there's a much wider range of crops that are growing. Yeah. I think on the organic farm, there were like 20 different crops. 
over the uh, like 15,000 acres of the farm. Yeah. And the new growers that you're bringing in, do they need any specialized equipment or do they pretty much have what they need to, to plant and harvest? Um, our farmers have what they need. Um, the longer they're in it, they start thinking about more specialized equipment for hemp just to make it go that much better. But um, to start, they definitely don't need um, any additional equipment other than what they already have on the farm, particularly for the stocks. They've just got to be set up to uh, plant it, to cut it, um, to uh, rake it and uh, windrow it and bale it okay. and deliver. Um, is there a lot of no-till out there or like, what are they doing for planting? They're drilling it. Just tell me a little bit about that end of it. They do drill. Uh, sometimes they do no-till. Sometimes they don't. The no-till decision is a lot of the times based on what the moisture is in the soil at planting time. Um, there's some advantages to not always no-tilling because um, if you have the moisture sufficient to uh, do it in the in the more conventional way rather than no tilling, you'll probably end up with less trash in the field. Mm. And it's, it's really hard if you have a hemp bell with other material in it to separate it out at processing. Right. Uh, it's not insurmountable, but it takes a lot of thought when you're no tilling um, how to make sure you don't get anything but hemp in your bell. Right. Um, as a side note, you should maybe talk to Steve Groff. He's our cover crop coach down here in PA. Maybe you have, but he's trying out, I think it's called a merger. So yes. he can, yeah. So that's some neat stuff that's happening. It is exciting. Um, so what other kind of like challenges or learning curves are the farmers up against in South Dakota? Like, is it in, it's, I mean, it's not easy, but like, is it an easy sell for you to get them to, to come on? Or do you have to do a lot of, you know, sort of consulting or agronomic uh, stuff? Tell me about like that process of bringing farmers in and how you, how you sort of, you know, get them on board, make them, make them part of the team. Right. Uh, so the first two years, uh, there was a lot of work to do to bring the first farmers on. Um, a little bit before that, we organized uh, as a state hemp industry into the South Dakota Industrial Hemp Association. And uh, our key board members, uh, which would include myself, um, Derek Doman with Horizon Hemp Seeds, and John Peterson with Dakota Hemp and Wakanda, did uh, right at about 60 educational meetings with farmers in little meeting halls, bars, restaurants, all across Eastern South Dakota. And sometimes we would have 30 people, sometimes we would have two, occasionally we'd have a no-show. But the the message did get out and uh, the media was very friendly to us, it covered a lot of those events, so it amplified our education efforts. And at the end of the day, now we're sitting at a place where going forward, it doesn't seem like we have to repeat those efforts every year. Now the pipeline is established, people call us, they're interested in growing. Uh, they've seen their neighbors grow it. Yeah. And uh, the coffee shops are full of the talk that um, brings people to look at hemp as an op option. Okay, yeah. Um, your governor, uh, Governor Nome, is that how you say her name? Yes. Where is she on industrial hemp? Because I know like she's got opinions on other, other uh, cannabis. Right. So the governor is against uh, Delta H. She uh, just uh, signed a bill that was passed overwhelming by our legislature uh, to ban Delta-8. On the industrial hemp for grain and fiber, she's very favorable. Um, she's um, obviously giving instruction to our Department of Ag to work really well with us um, in um, promoting uh, hemp as a crop and in being real easy to work with from a regulation standpoint. And kind of what's gone under the radar is that uh, the governor about three weeks ago uh, signed a bill uh, for industrial hemp, which again, decreased the amount of regulation on our farmers. Uh, for example, now, instead of doing our background checks, 
every year. Now it's spread out like in some other states to every three years, uh, which the USDA allows. Uh, there was another change uh, to update our rules to be what they are with USDA for um, the amount of um, uh, range in which the farmer uh, can still remediate their crops go over the 0.3 because we were stuck at the interim rule uh, rule which was 0.5 and now we're up to the one percent uh, so that's a big help to farmers that de-risk them um, quite a bit because it's pretty easy to remediate under the USDA options and then uh, she also said or signed in this bill that the legislature passed uh, that now when a farmer has a hemp fiber stock bale, um, they can sell it uh, to another farmer or someone else, just like an alfalfa bale. It doesn't have to go to a, a licensed process facility. And uh, that's a huge help because sometimes, uh, not often, but you do see some crop failures where the weeds just came up too fast with the hemp and then it can't be purchased uh, by a processor. And so it's good for the farmer to have the option to use that bale for bedding for animals or, or find some other use for it. And so you want that farmer to have to have a license to hold onto the bale for that. And maybe it's the neighboring farmer that has the cows that would like to use it for bedding and that farmer doesn't have a license. So we've solved that problem. And that's what we like about our governor and our department of ag for industrial hemp is that they take a sensible approach to these things and South Dakota is a really good state to do hemp in. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, most of your hemp uh, that you're, you know, most of the farmers that you're connecting with are on the Eastern side of the state or how, what's your sort of like radius? Uh, we're definitely focused in Eastern South Dakota. That's where most of the farmland is. And then um, people will know that the Missouri River cuts through our state on the western side of the Missouri River. Mostly we have ranch land. Um, there are pockets of farmland, but it, it changes and is mostly not cropland. Okay. Um, so it seems like the marijuana stigma isn't really that important or doesn't sort of get in the way out there, or maybe talk to me a little bit about where, where we are with the marijuana stigma in South Dakota. So the first year when we were educating people, we would hear people ask questions or make jokes about industrial hemp uh, being marijuana and who was going to come and steal the crop and those kind of things. Uh, none of those things ever happened. Uh, but more importantly, by year two, nobody was saying that anymore. So after some education, the uh, attitude has uh, changed quite a bit and people clearly see the difference between the two. Again, I would say that that shows in kind of the politics of it that this bill that recently went through the legislature uh, passed out of its first committee on the Senate side with 100% of the vote, and then it went in onto the Senate floor. Again, 100% of the vote in favor. House side, 100% in committee came out um, in favor. And then on the House floor, uh, it was uh, only one vote against, which was uh, kind of a joke where somebody says, I'm not going to look up at the board and see everything green. And they kind of high five their other people. Somebody's always going to do that. But it was 67 votes in favor and one against of the 68 present. And then it went to the governor's desk and she signed it. So those legislators know what their constituents think about um, hemp and marijuana. And if they thought there was a big stigma, or that people can distinguish between the two, they wouldn't vote overwhelmingly in that fashion. Right, that's refreshing to hear. I, I, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so we talked about the, the farmers and I, I, I don't ask this too often anymore, um, but it's like, I'm, I'm concerned about like the farmers not getting the short end of the stick, right? And I feel like you have the, the farmer uh, just squarely in mind, um, are there things that you are doing or you think things that you think the industry in general needs to do to protect the farmer? Or what are some of the, the safeguards that are in place for you to, to make sure the farmer doesn't get the short end of the stick? Right. Uh, the, 
as long as the processing um, is successful and there are optic agreements for what comes out of the processing facility, uh, the farmer will be uh, protected. Where the industry can put some more attention is trying to direct more money into processing um, to uh, put more capital there. And then that's going to shore everything up for the, the two ends of processing, the intake from the farmers and then the offtake that um, all the people bringing on uh, hemp uh, products, uh, they need to have that source. I think we've all had these conversations. Some people used to call it the uh, problem of uh, which comes first, right. the chicken, or the egg, whether it's the farmer, or the processor. And um, I won't claim this as my own quote, uh, Robin Destich, who was on your podcast at a different time, he said, Ken, we've solved that. Uh, it's processing first. <laughs> if there's a processor and they purchase the bales, that's a market for the farmers. And as long as the farmers are paid a full amount for their crop, just like they would be with corn and soybeans, uh, they're happy. Um, and so the, the farmer is in a good place. Um, the processors uh, are still learning all across the country and all of them have different different struggles and so if any in any, if any in any particular region a uh, processor goes down and those other ones that are not um that are still going are not able to pick up those bales uh then that will be a problem for the farmer right. so that's the that's the risk for the farmer right now right well it's good to know that we've solved the chicken and the egg mystery but is processing the chicken or the egg. Doesn't matter though, I guess. Um, <laughs> <for that. laughs> so are there certain varieties that you require your farmers to grow? And do you provide seed? Where do you source the seed? Tell me about that end of things. So most of the seed uh, source for our farmers comes through Horizon Hemp Seeds uh, with Derek Dolman. Uh, the approach of Horizon Hemp Seeds is to be a one-stop shop to sell any kind of uh, seed variety that someone wants that will work well in our region and by our experience with our soil and our conditions does not go hot because we do not want to put the farmers at risk. That, that would be another risk factor that we've talked about. And fortunately, in all three years that hemp have been growing in South Dakota, no one's had to uh, destroy their crop. They've been able to sell it. Um, but we're very protective of that for the farmers and uh, Horizon Hemp Seeds is as well. Uh, so they uh, um, they started out by selling Canadian varieties uh, like Vega and Anka, and then they, got, they have certified seed fields for those varieties um, in South Dakota, which lowers the cost of the seed for our farmers. And now they're doing a similar thing uh, with other varieties um, from European countries. Okay. All right. So I, I saw you in Pennsylvania, I guess it was about a year ago, at a hempcrete yes. workshop um, up at Cameron McIntosh's, Amerishon Cast Hemp. He does those uh, workshops. You were there. You drove all the way out from South Dakota. And when I talked to you, you were telling me um, about a hempcrete project that you were doing back home. It was like a, a winter storage facility for bees, which I thought was really interesting. So I want to ask you about that that facility, and then I want to talk to you about, um, is it apiary? Is that the right word? Right. Yeah. So yeah, did you finish the, uh, the hempcrete project, and did the bees survive? Oh, those are all good questions. So at our open house, we had a very nice rendering of what it will look like someday that was prepared by uh, Carolyn uh, Dunn. And uh, Carol Caroline um, has, uh, she kind of came and looked at uh, hemp fields and she's um, uh, a designer. And we have the whole concept, but we have not built the hempcrete winter storage solution for bees yet. Okay. All right. But you do have a winter storage for the bees. It's not like they're outside freezing. You you <laughs> you have them taken care of. Yeah. So yes, this year the bees went to Texas to hang out until it's time for the snow to go away in South Dakota and they'll return here in May. Oh, okay. Wow. I had no idea that bees just traveled like that. That's great. Um, so yeah, I'm fascinated by your, your family 
B B business. Um, was that? Tell me, like, who is it? Your maybe your grandfather founded it, or just tell me like a, a bit of the history of the company. A H Meyer is my great grandfather. He was born in Switzerland. Uh, he immigrated to the U.S. and he started to work uh, for some years with the Miller uh, B Company in California. Uh, just like now, they had almond groves and bees would pollinate almonds and grandpa would sleep in a in a tent uh, at the almond groves and do his beekeeping work. And then a fun family history is uh, he got married to great grandmother and she wasn't really excited about sleeping in the tent in the almond orchard. So then they worked himself into a, a little house. And then eventually um, he formed his own beekeeping business with his two sons, my grandpa and my great uncle. And then um, my father became a part of that business. And now uh, three of my father's children, myself, a brother and sister, uh, carry on with uh, the beekeeping industry work. Okay. So Switzerland, California, how'd you end up in South Dakota? Uh, beekeepers are are kind of migratory in nature, chasing the flowers that are best for the bees. And so the, the business of great grandpa and grandpa moved from uh, California to Idaho, Utah, Montana, and then finally out to the Dakotas to take advantage of the large acres of CRP, which um, had a lot of sweet clover on them. And uh, maybe we would, would have still been moving around to different locations, but back in the early 70s, we started building some facilities and capacity to render services for beekeepers. So we have a beeswax rendering facility where we work with over 100 different beekeeping companies to render their beeswax and make it marketable. And then we also uh, pack honey for the beekeepers in our region that they then give to a lot of the farmers that give permission for them to put bees on their land. And so now that you have facilities in place, you don't keep moving around necessarily right, but right. on the flowers. So I don't think there's any way to like overstate the importance of bees. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about how much we as humans depend on bees. The number that we often talk about is that uh, every third bite of what we eat, if we don't want a very, very simple diet, um, we have the privilege of eating because a bee pollinated a crop, you know, a grain, a fruit, go down the list. And at the end of the day, if the bees aren't out doing that work, our diet and our nutrition is uh, severely curtailed. Yeah. Um, I know over, I don't know, the past 20 years or so, there's been sort of a lot of talk about hive collapse and mites and things kind of like causing stress on the bee colonies and populations. Um, have, have you seen that or has that had an effect on your, your business? Uh, yes, it has. And it's changed the uh, beekeeping practices for all commercial beekeepers. So to kind of give perspective, uh, in the early 80s, 70s, before um, we had the mite problem, which has continued to this day from then, the average loss um, for a beekeeper over the course of the year might have been 15% uh, of their colonies from all the things that you could consider, weather, moving around, the, uh, you, uh, it's an, an insect after all, um, and everything that has a lifespan can die uh, and has some fragility to it, right? But 15% loss. Um, now it's more common to be about double that, uh, wow. that even with doing all the controls that you can do for mites, um, you plan on like a 30% loss. And then beekeepers have built into their economic model to restock their bees each year. So the big industry for raising queen bees, um, the the cells um, where you, the queen bees will come from, um, buying package bees, buying and every every beekeeper knows how to take a hive and one hive and make it into two hives by sharing the resources 
um, uh, they call it making nukes or splits. A nuke is the nucleus of a new hive. And you put the resources that in that nuke, that nucleus of a hive that when you add the queen, now that can take off and become a full hive again. Right. Wow. Um, how many bees do you have at any given time? So about 12 years ago, we were at our high point for uh, bees, uh, about 10,000 hives, um, and we traveled all over the country. We did sell our, our commercial uh, beehives to an, another outfit, and uh, since that time, we've concentrated mainly on our beeswax rendering and uh, honey packing services for beekeepers. Um, but we always keep um, at least uh, uh, 40 hives uh, still on location and, and do the beekeeping work with those. Okay. Um, the species of bees, are they like a, a European honeybee or do you do native bees or how does, how does that work? Yeah, they, they are U European um, species of bees um, by and large. Okay. All right. So bees, hemp they intersect somewhere i'm i'm assuming can you tell me like your favorite spot where bees intersect with hemp yes my favorite spot is in the research being done by um uh, some product makers for beekeepers i can think of one in particular where the hemp protein um could be of great benefit to the bees uh and the, that the bees like the protein so i know You've had plenty of discussions about hemp protein for cows and laying hens. Well, add honeybees to your list of uh, animals that can benefit from hemp protein. And the reason this happens and it's such a big deal is uh, they get their nutrition from, the, from pollen, but the pollen is not available year round. And uh, so the work that gets undertaken by commercial beekeepers is to trick the bees into thinking that they're still pollen or some kind of nutrition source out there um, to where they don't uh, slow down the production of new bees. Okay. Well, you can think of a beehive in nature. They're going to say winter's coming on. We want fewer bees to feed through the winter and the queen's going to start stop uh, laying eggs. Well, the problem with that is most uh, bees uh, are going to go out to California to pollinate almonds at the end of January, uh, the 1st of February, definitely not the definition of springtime. And those almond grove um, owners are not going to want a little tiny box of bees. They pay um, around $200 a hive to have those hives in their orchards because they have to have the pollination. Yeah. And so they require a certain number of frames of bees inside that bee box to pay on the contract. Wow. So, so what beekeepers do is they feed protein patties that are formulated to the bees to stimulate them and keep them growing and building um, so that they can go into the almond grove at full force. <laughs> That's fantastic. So th it's the protein powder from the, the hemp grain. It's made into right. like a, like a pat. It would, and then you, what you sprinkle it in the, in the yeah, racks so or, so, and they, so they eat right it. Now, the, this is just being looked at Oh, okay. because it's other products that are sold on the market uh, for this, but any of that, that you just described could be the way um, that it's applied. I've, I've definitely seen pictures where it's been sprinkled in and uh, they they like it. Okay. Something that has to happen is that the the protein has to be milled down to the size of a bee's mouth. Which is what? How big is a bee's mouth? <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like uh, at 100 micron or below, uh, the beekeeper can handle it because they handle pollen in nature um, as high as that hundred micron and then below. That's really cool. So uh, there, there you go. Another industry that hemp has its sights set on disrupting. So, all right. That is correct. Yeah. Cool. Other, other interesting intersections of hemp and bees? Uh, yes. Uh, kind of anecdotally, um, there's, um, a bee inspector who is also a, uh, 
involved with hemp fields in North Dakota because it's not uncommon wherever you have a state ag department that the people do multiple things. And so I'm thinking of a particular bee inspector that also has a responsibility to go and uh, get the test samples from the hemp fields and do all of that. And uh, she's told me that um, she's seen bees at particular times of year just as thick on the, the hemp when it has the pollen as she's seen on canola flowers, wow. which are canola flowers are really tasty and attractive to bees. Uh, the bees cannot make nectar out of the uh, the hemp plant okay, like they would out of other floral sources, but it is a good pollen source. Uh, for the bees. Okay. Um, so they, what does it mean that they can't make nectar out of it? Like how does that um, affect them? Yeah. It just means that it's not a place for them to go and get nectar to make honey. Okay. So, so there's, there's no hemp no, honey. Oh, there's, no, there's no hemp honey. <laughs> okay. All right. But they like it as a source of nutrition. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, last year I was out at Steve Gross farm in Lancaster County and he had some really tall hemp, just he sort of left it up as a sort of a showpiece. And yeah, it was full of bees. It was neat. I've got some video of that. I, I, can, would, I, I would love to have a copy of that. That would be exciting. To okay, I'll publish it and I'll, I'll send you a link. Thank you. Cool. Um, well, I think that, let me, uh, I think that's all of my questions here. Is there anything else that I, we were anticipating me asking you? Uh, no, I think that we've had a very engaging conversation and uh, maybe raised a few new points about hemp, especially as it relates to honeybees. Yeah, I am fascinated by bees. I love bees, right? I mean, I'm a I'm a gardener, so I know I know what's up, right? But um, yeah, just I I I'm looking at you here, and you you know you're clean shaven, but have you ever done the like the beard of bees? Have you ever done that? <laughs> I have not been so brave as to tape the queen bee on my neck and have those pheromones going out and attracting all those bees. But I've had a lot of bees on me uh, as far as like the bee suit. When you yeah. when you go to uh, make those splits that I talked about where you're taking a hive apart to make two, uh, you get a lot of bees in the air. And sometimes the weather's a little cooler. When the weather's cooler, that's when they like to cling to you for warmth. Okay. Wow. I didn't realize that they put the queen on their, their neck to do that. That's, <laughs> that's why I love doing this podcast, because I, I learn stuff that I never saw coming, right? <laughs> that's right. So that's cool. All right. Well, Ken Meyer from Complete Hemp Processing in South Dakota, it has been an honor and a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, Eric. All right, how about that? Ken Meyer from Complete Hemp Processing in South Dakota. Uh, this interview sort of stayed with me a little bit longer than some interviews do. I've just been thinking about the bees and how much we rely on them and how they've been part of our culture and our existence, our survival for such a long time. What did Ken say in that interview? Like every third bite of food uh, is made possible by bees. So that's incredible. Now, this might be going out on a limb here, but I feel like the bee could be a symbol of the hemp industry. Right? Yeah, work with me here. So just thinking about the bees and everything that they do. So I thought I would ask the chat GPT robot to sort of give me, give me an understanding of the things that bees are admired for. And it spits out this list of things, but the, the final sentence says, Overall, Overall bees, bees are, are admired for their, for their industriousness, industriousness community, community spirit, spirit efficiency, and, and the, the vital ecological, ecological services they, they provide. provide. Now that sounds like some of the people I've met in the hemp space, Ken Meyer included. So this morning I realized I had a handful of follow-up questions for Ken. So he very graciously agreed to sit for another quick interview because I, I wanted to ask a few more questions. So this isn't the end of the show. This is, you know, like an intermission. Here we go to part two of my interview with Ken Meyer, beekeeper and hemp processor.
All right. Well, hello again, Ken. Thank you for coming back on a call with me because after our call, I've been thinking a lot about bees, right? So I just have more questions for you about bees and as it as the bees relate to hemp. So um, first follow-up question, what have you learned from the bees? Like as a fourth generation beekeeper, what have the bees taught you or what are they teaching you as you build out the epicenter of South Dakota's industrial hemp processing and supply chain infrastructure? Well, uh, one saying in beekeeping, and it's probably in a lot of industries is, um, and the bees teach you this because they give you different results because nature gives you different results. And so uh, beekeepers have a saying that if you get 100 beekeepers in a room and you ask them a question as to how to do something, each one will have a different answer. And that's very applicable to the hemp world even though, um, and even more so because we're just starting um, in the United States with the hemp industry. And so um, even now being in the industry uh, for about four years on any given day, um, I can have different conversations with different people who I really respect in the industry and get completely different answers. And they're probably both right in in some, some manner. What is great about the honeybee is of course the, um, theme of sustainability that goes right along with hemp. Uh, there, uh, the honeybees and, and the hemp both give us um, some avenues to a- improve our planet and, and have it be a better, healthier place to live. Right. Um, are there certain like attributes that bees are known for that, you know, can, could inspire people? Uh, the, the honeybees are part of what they call a superorganism. Uh, so they they all work together uh, to um, to achieve their goal of taking care of the hive and uh, to produce the the honey. Um, now I don't know if we want to go so far as to compare everything about honeybees to um, other situations in life. Uh, the honeybees uh, are a predominantly female uh, group. And so um, when it comes time for winter uh, and they have to conserve resources for the hive, then they uh, they kick the drones out to die and then they come up with some more in the spring when they need them. That's quite a system, right? Of efficiency, uh, maybe? Very efficient. <laughs> All right. So that's what I was thinking about. Like, what, what do the bees have to teach us? All right. So another question, but now we're getting away from bees and going back to complete hemp processing. Um, and we didn't really talk about this in the first interview. We sort of alluded to it, but um, I w- want to hear about the market that you're creating. Like, who's buying the material that you are processing? Where is it going? What kind of products is it going into? That sort of thing. So tell me about that. Uh, so the two main products uh, that we have coming out are, of course, the uh, bass fiber and the hemp herd. Uh, we're able to sell right now, fortunately, um, all of our um, hemp herd, we do see ourselves uh, ramping up on throughput at our facility and having more hemp herd available to sell. So we welcome inquiries on that. Um, most of that is going into the uh, hemp animal bedding market. That seems to be really growing and uh, getting strong. And then uh, we have also sold to some of the hemp lime or hemp creek uh, builders. I would say on the bass fiber side, that's maybe the most exciting because there's so many products that are are seeming to be about on the cusp to use the the hemp fiber in larger volumes and most of the calls i get each day are actually about the bass fiber but to uh it's not being sold at scale yet at least from our facility um what's it going to take to get that to scale uh i i think it's this dance that's going on between the end user for bass fiber, which tends to be um, big industrial complexes like the automotive industry. Mm. And, and then um, here we are in the hemp arena selling a natural fiber that at least initially is fairly expensive to produce, especially compared to synthetic fibers. Uh, the, staying with the automotive industry as an example, they're very interested and they want it but the dance is to figure out the price that works for everybody involved uh, so that it can come to market at scale. So on the processing side, we have to process 
more at scale and efficiently. And then on the automotive side, they have to uh, figure out, um, you know, how where that price point can make sense for them. And we'll see if the two can match. And that and that same conversation is also playing out with many other different applications that the Bass Fiber would be involved with. Um, the ones that we all follow, like uh, hemp texture and using the hemp bass fiber for insulation. Um, again, it's looking at what is the price point that the market will accept. Um, products like that, that just look like products people are already used to. So just a kind of one-to-one -one replacement are definitely the the best uh, chances to move right into the marketplace, but the price has to be somewhat comparable. Right. What do you think needs to happen to bring that price down? I'll start at the in the field with the farmer. Um, I'm a big proponent that w whatever you're looking at for the farmer, you always have to show that it uh, you're going to be able to compensate the farmer at least uh, the amount of income that they would earn from their their other highest paying crop on the farm, mm -hmm. which in our area in the Midwest is usually corn. Um, this year, the price of corn is lower, so it's a little easier to compete. Yeah. I think you mentioned that the last yeah, time. Yeah, you did. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, but um, we'll always have to do that um, on the farmer side. So there's only so much you can drive the price down there. Uh, now, um, improved uh, genetics that continue to increase the yields that the farmers get might mean that the uh, price uh, for the initial processor can go down as to what they have to pay for the bales. Um, and there could be um, other developments along those lines that would help. Anything that would come and help the farmer have the crop in his field for less time will give value back to the farmer because then the farmer can use their land for other things. So those would be some things that could happen on the, on the farmer side. Okay. But some of them seem kind of uh, long term to accomplish, maybe. Uh, then when we get uh, to the process side, again, it really is about scaling up and getting more efficient. I think I'm repeating myself at this point. Uh, but the uh, uh, the consumer demand um, is certainly um, growing for sustainable products. I imagine, though, it will be somewhat comparable to going to the supermarket and buying organic food, um, certified organic um, or grass fed beef. All those things will um, have a consumer market to a certain size, and that price could be at a premium for first adopters. Sure. Eventually, for the planet, we want hemp to um, overperform and do better than that and be something that all consumers, um, will want and can afford. Right. Okay. Next question. Um, you said that most of the, the hemp growing happening in South Dakota is on the Eastern side. You said the Western side is mostly branch land. Um, is that like, do you see like grain production in your area too? And I guess my question there is, would, do you see yourself also going into grain processing? Um, our particular business will probably not go into grain processing just because we have our hands full with just uh, processing the stock and handling all of that. Mm -hmm. But within our South Dakota hemp ecosystem, as a group, we definitely talk about it and want to um, make sure that that is also done in the state. Um, it, it really strengthens the market for the farmers because then they have more places to go with their crop, which gives stability. And then for the people processing uh, hemp stock, it gives us an avenue to get the stock at a more competitive, lower price because mm -hmm. the farmer makes their money principally on the grain right. and they're not looking to get um, necessarily, uh, well, not all of their income from the stocks at that point. And so they can sell it for less. Right. Right. Okay. Um, are you involved in like the hemp feed coalition or, you know, trying to bring some changes to the, the, you know, hemp as an animal feed? Uh, I'm chuckling a little bit because uh, you and I were both out at the um, Montana hemp summit. And so we know um, with the help of Ken Elliott and the rest of the team, we're all members of the hemp feed coalition. <laughs> if we went to that event, 
Um, I've certainly, um, I'm very much in favor of the work they're doing and um, the, the potential um, strength that it's going to bring to the to the industry. Yeah. Um, I am not one of the laboring oars in that organization, though. Okay, fair enough. All right. Well, Ken, I know you're busy. I'll let you get back to work. Thank you for taking a second call with me today to, uh, you know, answer my follow-up questions. Uh, I really enjoyed our first interview and I look forward to seeing you, I guess, out in, in Colorado, maybe next week. Yes. Very good. Thanks, Eric. All right. Thanks, Ken. Okay. Now it's the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening, but yeah, it's time to go. Got to get out of here. We got stuff to do. Anyway, thank you for listening. My name is Eric Harlock. I'm the senior digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Check us out online at lancasterfarming.com. Yeah. Uh, what else? What else can I tell you? Well, like I said, I'm going to be at NOCO next week. So if you're going to be out there, shoot me a message. Uh, we'd love to meet you and hear about what you're doing. An email to podcast at Lancaster Farming will do the trick. So, all right. Until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. This episode of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2024 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Eric Carlock with production help from Matt Lee. The music you hear throughout the show was courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. Industrial Hemp. Industrial Hemp.